My name is Rick Cherok, and I am professor of history at Ozark Christian College, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about the Restoration Movement. As we look at this movement, uh, which had its origin in the thoughts of, of Barton Stone and Alexander Campbell and a few others, I'd like to begin by reading a text of scripture that was very influential, uh, highly important to their way of thinking, their ideas. I want to look at John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, we have Jesus's prayer. And this is a prayer that he prayed uh, right after he had instituted the Lord's Supper, shortly before he had uh, uh, gone to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in this prayer, he says, while I was with them, starting with verse 12, I'm not uh, reading the entire thing for, for brevity's purposes. I want to look at just starting with verse 12. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, this is an interesting passage that had a lot of influence on these early leaders within the Restoration Movement. And a couple of themes that sort of emerge from this passage that are going to really uh, motivate their thought are, are ideas that uh, really should have an influence on us as well. It's kind of interesting to note that uh, uh, in this passage, passage, Jesus talked about ideas like unity, and he talked about let them be one as we are one. He talked about this concept of unity. He talked also about truth. And this idea of your word is truth. The, the gospel is truth. He was trying to make a point here to them that they must seek out the truth of God's word, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Uh, but then he also goes on to this point of unity and this idea of let them be one as you and I are one. But the key concept, perhaps the most important concept, is the concept of evangelism, that the world may know. This is a movement that really is focused upon the idea of reaching the world for Christ. It's a movement in which unity and truth are important factors, but they are factors that lead us to this idea of winning the world for Christ. That's the ultimate goal. When you start focusing upon unity, you could get to the point where anything goes. Just as long as we can get together, it's all right. Everything's acceptable. But then you offset that with the idea of truth. We gotta get back to the truth of scripture, what scripture truly teaches, what, tru what, what scripture truly uh, leads us to know about God and how God would have us to live. And these are, are sort of combating ideas that tug against one another. Uh, you know, with the idea of unity, there's this concept of, uh, of, of we just, you know, we just wanna try to get everybody together. But then with truth, you could get to the point of, and this truth idea manifests itself as restoration in some ways. You can get to the point of we've got to uh, restore the ideas that we know are truth, get back to our truth. And so this becomes kind of an overwhelming or overarching idea of, of I have my narrow little area of truth and only my area of truth matters. But the, the real sentiment or the real idea that Jesus is going after is not 
we focus on totally trying to gain unity or we total, totally focus on trying to gain what we understand as truth, these are, these are means to an end. These are, are ideas that lead to a concept of winning the world to Christ. And this restoration movement began as a movement to reach the world for Christ. That's the focus. That's the focal point. That's what Jesus was praying about. Can we reach this world for Christ? And so the restoration movement is going to have a number of factors that are very influential on it. Some of these factors include ideas like rationalism. Baconian logic emerged uh, in, in English thought, and as Baconian logic comes along, this movement is going to accept this, is going to adopt this idea of logic, of, of rational thinking, of rational understanding, even a rational study of Scripture. Rather than relying on mystic feelings or mystical ideas or sensations that we assume are from the Lord, this movement is going to focus on the idea of let's get back to what the Scripture says. What does the Scripture teach us? Let's, let's rely on God's revelation of Himself to us. So this concept of, of revelation, of, of revealed Scripture, becomes very, very important. But there are going to be other factors that influence this movement as it emerges. I mean, in American culture, this, this, this movement probably had its origin in many ideas that are European and ideas that uh, have their background in Europe on I mean, the Scottish Enlightenment movements and you're also going to have evangelistic ideas in, in uh, uh, Scotland that are going to influence this movement. But now you're going to also have this movement bringing its, coming to its fruition in America. And in America, you tend to have this idea of primitivism that begins to emerge. Primitivism... Primitivism is an idea that we want to get back to the way things were originally. It probably emerged largely from American government. I mean, as, uh, as the American Revolution emerged and America separates from, from Great Britain, they begin to say, how can we make a, a government that will last, which will endure? And they say, let's look back to the ancients, back to Rome and back to Greece and some of these ancient philo uh, philosophical ideas and thinkers and their concepts of government as we create our new government here in the United States. And this idea of getting back to the ancient kind of bled over even to the Christian idea where you had many who started to say, let's get back to the original ideas of Christianity. And so Alexander Campbell, for instance, will publish a series of articles called the, uh, the Restoration of the Ancient Order of Things, back to how they were originally. And a lot of people begin to, to buy into this. In fact, you're going to have these movements that pop up in one place after another that are Christians-only movements. Um, uh, in New England, you'll have a, a group of Christians only. In Virginia, you'll have some Christians only advocates. And uh, in Kentucky and other places, you're going to have these groups that emerge and, and kind of independent of others, just pop up and say, hey, we want to get back to the biblical norms, back to the ideas of how Christianity was in the beginning. We want to restore this New Testament Christian ideal. And so you have this primitivist notion that emerges uh, within, uh, within American culture uh, in the early 1800s. Furthermore, you're going to have a, a notion of millennialism. In American thought, you, you move into this period where there's this concept of, of bringing about the millennium. Uh, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 5, there's this discussion of the millennium. And there's a lot of different interpretations of what this meant. But in early American thought, in the 1800s, early 1800s, many believed we were going to establish this millennial kingdom, this millennial uh, Christian society, this golden age, uh, especially after the War of 1812. When the War of 1812 ended and Americans said, you know, we've 
fought the battle of independence. Now we have reaffirmed our independence and we're building roads and we're building schools and we're building canals and things are looking great. We're, we're just on the verge of ushering in Christ's millennial kingdom. And they became convinced about this. And so you're going to have some of these people that uh, become advocates of the restoration movement saying, okay, unity and truth and world evangelism because we're right on the verge of the establishment of the millennium. Uh, Alexander Campbell uh, published for 40 years uh, a, a magazine called The Millennial Harbinger. And a harbinger is something that brings something in. We're bringing in the millennium, he thought, by our work and by our efforts here. And so he was convinced that this is really something special, really something unique. And so so, so this concept of millennium, and, and millennialism was very, very big. One author says that uh, uh, 19th century America, early 19th century America, he described it as being drunk on millennialism because it was such a prevalent concept within that time. And certainly this restoration movement was influenced by this notion of millennialism. Uh, but in addition to primitivism, and in addition to millennialism, there is the concept of religious pluralism. That became sort of a part of American uh, culture and American society as America established, unlike most nations around the world, most of the uh, more prominent nations, they did not have a state church. There was no Church of the United States or, or uh, you know, you, you go to Germany, the Lutheran church became sort of the, the state-sponsored church. Or you go to uh, uh, England, you have the Church of England. You didn't have that in the United States. And in fact, it was kind of an open market for religious ideas. And so you're going to have many, many people uh, advocating their own ideas and their own concepts. And these people in the restoration movement said, rather than focusing on human ideas or human notions or, or human goals, let's, 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 let's establish a group of churches that are going to focus on getting back to the biblical ideas. And they looked at that prayer, that prayer of John 17, unity and truth to win the world to Christ. And they said, let this be our focal point. Let this be sort of the idea. So this, uh, if, if you will, the philosophy, the philosophy that drives this restoration movement is a philosophical framework that says, we are people who are striving to uh, get back to the Bible. We want to be biblical people. We are, are, are a people who, who, who want unity, unity based upon Scripture. Uh, one of the slogans is, uh, we're not the only Christians, but we are Christians only. We don't want to see ourselves as the only. We're, we're not people who are trying to be isolationist in the sense of, hey, we're the only people that are possibly Christian. Nobody else could be. But yet we don't want to be a part of a denominational setup or a denominational framework. We simply want to be Christians. And the purpose of all of this, the goal of all of this, is that we might win the world to Christ. So unity and truth in an effort to win the world to Christ. And this is the philosophy, this is the framework, this is the idea that motivates this restoration movement.